Hey guys, Ready 3 one Lane here again, and given that it's actually negative 11 out right now without wind chill, who knows how cold it really is, shooting's kind of tough. It's cold enough that you can't actually even get duct tape to stick to itself out there. So we're going to kind of use this time to do a lot of our classroom type stuff and talk about some historical perspectives on tactics, strategy, training, things like that, that have really led to what we do in the modern age, but maybe we don't understand, and these are things that are very interesting to me. This is where my greatest passion is. So. We're going to talk about today are the tactics of infiltration. Now, sometimes you hear them called Houthier tactics uh, by men uh, by the name of Oscar von Houthier, who was an officer in the German army in World War One. Now, in my research, I come to find out that only Americans use that term. Um, the Germans have made absolutely no mention whatsoever in any of their reports from the time of using Houthier tactics. So, we'll just call them infiltration tactics. So, coming out of World War One. Um, we're all familiar with the basics of World War I, I think, and how most things that came about in World War I have really led to what we know as far as modern maneuver warfare, especially armored warfare and things like that. So, you know, I could talk all day about this, but keep it nice and short. We know the basics as far as World War I being mostly a stalemate of trench warfare. Um, largely, um, little ground was given or lost throughout most of the war until various parts. And so, these came about for a couple of main reasons. Now we could talk forever about these, but the three main reasons that I'm gonna list here are one, defensive power. And so defensive power coming primarily from the weapons of the day, artillery um, was powerful in a way that had never ever before been experienced. It caused 70% of all the casualties in World War I. And up until that point, all the wars fought on mainland Europe were caused, uh, the casualties were you know, caused primarily by the personal weapons, the rifles, the muskets, of the infantry, so this was a massive swing. In addition to that, you have the machine gun. While it's not very mobile at the time, um, very capable of covering large areas of ground with withering fire and really making attacks futile against a lot of stuff like that. And in addition, now you start to have the addition of things like barbed wire, um, you know, and gas and stuff like that that all benefit the defensive. Okay, number two is the size of the armies, and I wrote conscripts below that. So what I mean by conscripts is all the armies were essentially made of draftees once you got past about the first year of the war. And so the armies were big in a way that had never ever been imagined before. Now, as we've gone beyond World War I into World War II, armies have gotten bigger, but up until this point, they had never seen that before. So armies were so unbelievably huge that by and large, they were much less well-trained than they had been at the start of the war. And now you also end up with some tactics where just destroying enemy troops does not grant a victory. Um, and so we see this in World War I. The Germans killed at least two for every one that they lost, and they lost millions. The French and British both lost millions, but neither one was able to come to a decisive end. And so that's why the army size matters. Number three is the battlefield depth. So again, because of the weapons of the day, battlefields took a depth that had not before been seen. And so instead of being uh, a couple to a few hundred meters deep, um, you know, between the front lines and the baggage train and things like that, now you have lines that are potentially miles and miles deep. And then, um, you know, this only gets exacerbated as we've gone into the modern era. So just beating an enemy at the front line or just beating in that initial contact is not enough to render someone a victory. We have to find a way to get beyond that. So that's where we come into the infiltration tactics. Uh, so, I'm going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about the strategy behind that and what was hoped to be achieved with these tactics. Okay, talking now about the actual tactics and the strategy of infiltration. So, I've drawn up here a pretty crude kindergarten mock-up of what a World War I um, battlefield defense might look like. Now, I admit I'm a terrible artist, so you kind of have to work with me a little bit. But now, we have successive lines, the first, second, and third lines of defense, the artillery, and then back here, representing the objective, which may be a town, a supply depot, a rail depot, things like that. Like we said, in modern warfare, the goal is no longer just to kill the troops, it's to get objectives that can actually bring about a successful battle. Okay, so now what we need to do is dispel a couple of myths and talk about, um, you know, how battlefields on World War I were actually connected. We all have this um, vision in our head from the movies of a massive line of guys with bayonets fixed and they blow a whistle and they all run across no man's land and in the trenches on the opposite side there's a massive line of other dudes with bayonets fixed on their rifles and then they clash in the trenches 
and you know whoever wins kind of has it out. Now at the beginning of the war that was somewhat true but as the war went on that was not how armies conducted defensive operations by and large and the reason for that is quite obvious. If you think about football, if you run a goal line defense in the middle of the field, if you happen to call the right play and you stop them, everything is great. But if they slip through just a little bit, there's absolutely nobody behind there, all right? And so same thing happens with armies. If you leave all of your troops in a very forward position, they're gonna get pounded by artillery. Like we said, artillery causes massive casualties. And so you're gonna take a ton of casualties defending an area. So now what we have is a front line that is primarily defended by outposts, whether they're listening posts or observation posts and patrols, but it's very thinly manned, not a lot of troops in here, and there's places where these patrols can jump off um, to go, but there's no massive amounts of men in these positions. When we get back to the second line of troops, now we have our actual first area that's gonna be very heavily contested. So these trenches are dug in a zigzag, which is how they actually dug them back then to avoid enfilade fire, and they would have hard points machine gun positions and things along there, and especially on the German side, they tended to have concrete pillboxes in the Hindenburg line, so this line would be very heavily contested. This third line back here would contain mobile reserves, that way they could immediately counterattack, drive the enemy back, and or fill in gaps as necessary. They would have communication trenches running between these lines to connect them so that they could um, get there with minimal casualties. Behind that, you have your artillery and your mortars um, to be protected, and they're back from the battlefield, and behind that further is your objective, which is supplying all of this. So we need to think about what's gonna happen here. So as my attack begins all the way over here, as I come through this first line, all right, we're already under artillery fire. We're gonna start to take machine gun fire from these second line positions as they're firing on their FPFs, right? And now the outposts that are here are gonna be calling in that artillery, making sure it's accurate, and also using their rifles, causing a few casualties. So as we're coming through, we're getting slowed down, we're taking casualties, all the way up into the second line where we're getting to our heavy fighting. So by the time armies got to that second line, what they start to run into is that the battlefield is so absolutely smashed from all the, all the artillery hitting that it's very hard to move through there. You've taken a ton of casualties, so your force is down. So just getting the wounded out of there and getting reserves up takes a lot of time. And by this time, the enemy's already calculating what you're doing and they're counterattacking from this third line to drive you out. So that's the main reason that armies were taking so many casualties and why mass frontal assault with bayonets just did not work. That's where infiltration troops come in, and on the German side especially, we're all familiar with that word of the storm troops, the Stoßtruppen, they're shock troops. Okay, now that we got the meat and potatoes down basically of what a World War I battlefield, especially a defensive position looked like, we're gonna actually talk about the tactics of infiltration and specifically um, the tactics utilized by the Germans with their storm troopers, their fabled Stoßtruppen, and so, when attacking these objectives, obviously these long drawn out charges caused a lot of casualties. So what they figured out was that they needed specialized troops, these stormtroopers. These specialized troops would, instead of having a massive artillery barrage before they went over the top and then engaging in combat from the get-go, they had a very short, very, very accurate artillery barrage and often a creeping barrage. So as they were moving, the artillery was moving in front of them. They also advanced across no man's land with their rifles slung on their backs, carrying bags and bags of grenades, and they would carry pistols and sometimes submachine guns, the Bergman MP-18. In small groups, they would cover each other and they would avoid fighting at all, you know, at all costs. So their goal was not to fight any of these units here. Their goal was to infiltrate through these frontline positions to get to the actual objective. Like we said, artillery is causing 70% of the casualties on the battlefield, so we want to neutralize that. And the objective are the nerve centers behind that, the towns, the supply areas, the road and rail centers and things like that. So as these units move through, avoiding combat wherever possible, and when they did have to engage the enemy, they primarily engaged them with grenades. They realized that jumping in a trench and having it out hand to hand with other troops, basically everybody is gonna be about equal. So armies figured out you're gonna lose roughly half your troops in that kind of a fight. So what the stormtroopers did was when they drove the enemy back into these trenches and bunker positions, they threw grenades in, neutralized them, killed them all with grenades and moved on very quickly, took very few casualties comparatively, and then they kept moving with the utmost speed to get through these positions. Now, behind these shock troops, the second wave of a German assault would be troops specifically equipped to deal with these second line positions, these hardened positions. They would carry portable machine guns, the MGO 815, 
which for the time was pretty mobile. It still weighed about 95 pounds, which was a lot lighter than the MG-08. They would carry flamethrowers. They would carry more grenades and explosives, and they would specifically target and deal with these hard positions. That was their sole goal. Behind them, the third line and then successive lines were standard infantry, and their job was to deal with mopping up the infantry left behind. With their hard points shattered, their artillery neutralized, the infantry were very disorganized and were not nearly as effective a fighting force as they could be before. And so now this assault would just continue forward as it would go. Stormtroopers infiltrate through, second line does its thing, third line does its thing, all the way through until they get to the objectives. And now the Germans use these in the spring of 1918 in the so-called Spring Offensive or the Ludendorff Offensive almost to completion. They split the British and the French armies. They almost drove the British back to the sea, but they eventually became exhausted and failed at their objective, and then they were eventually defeated in a 100 days offensive that was largely, um, you know, French and Americans conducted that. But the tactic paved the way for what we would know now as modern maneuver warfare and especially armored warfare.